Okay, thank you very much, Jim. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, you said some very nice things about my uh, uh, background in history. Um, yes, my it was my great, great, great grandfather who emigrated from Ireland in about 1849. And so you guessed correctly on that. And um, <clears throat> the various honors that you cited, I think to me personally, the greatest honor I've had ever is when Fred Singer asked me to succeed him as chairman of the Science and Environmental Policy Project. That just meant so much to me that I had earned the appreciation of Fred Singer. So that's, that's really kind of why I'm here keeping pursuing this thing because of the honor that I owe to Fred Singer. Okay, so here's my title that you can see and we'll now go to the next slide. And I think I have to clear up something right away. Methane really does meet the criteria of greenhouse gas. It is that kind of molecule. However, it doesn't matter. It is irrelevant. And there's three reasons why. First of all, the physical properties of the real atmosphere, the numerical realities of infrared absorption, and also the amount and type of radiation that comes from the surface of the Earth. And you put these three things together and it turns out that methane doesn't matter. And honestly, it's really urgent that this reality become widely known uh, in governments all around the world. Obviously in America, I'm familiar with it, in Ireland, New Zealand, and other countries. As long as people believe that methane is a problem, they're going to spend a lot of money unnecessarily. And we'd like to avoid that. So my outline is uh, in two parts. First, I'm going to review what Van Weingarten and Happer have achieved, which is really a, a major breakthrough. Um, the, uh, they dealt with both nitrous oxide and methane, and I'll cover that briefly. The point is, the most important thing that they achieved was that they got it right. That is, their calculations, their theory agreed with data. That's a whole lot better than the IPCC models ever have. So when you find out that their method is valid, then you can trust and believe in their projections. And that's why we have knowledge now, thanks to them, about what methane and the other gases are likely to do. Second part that I'm gonna talk about is explain why global warming potential is a ridiculous and useless number. It was just a mistake in calculation. It's an oversimplified concept, it's applied incorrectly, but an awful lot of people believe it because it is so simple to take one number and balloon it up into something important. Anyway, the bottom line of all that we have to say today is that tighter regulations and other laws are pointless and unnecessary. Let's go on now. First thing I have to do is acknowledge that I'm talking about Van Weingarten and Happer's work, but I'm just the guy talking about it. I didn't do the work. Um, but on the other hand, I am a member of the CO2 coalition, and therefore I'm very proud to share the importance and significance of their work. And we all hope that this is going to lead to changes in government policy. Uh, a year or so ago, I think it was June 2021, uh, Will Happer gave a presentation and it was about the work by him and uh, William Van Weingarten about greenhouse gases. And what they did was they used the HITRAN database to calculate the intensities of spectral lines across the infrared. This is a massive database, it's huge. And it's got all kinds of spectroscopic data in it that go back over a hundred years of research, more than a hundred years, going all the way back to John Tyndall of 1860. Their model, uh, atmosphere that they cared about was real. And it did include water, H2O. That's very important because they did not use what's called the standard atmosphere. That is based on a, uh, an imaginary gas that doesn't exist. It contains no water. You can make that gas for purposes in the laboratory by eliminating water from real air. But when you're talking about atmosphere, it's real air, not dry air. It makes all the difference in the world. 
And honestly, for the IPCC to keep working with dry air is an enduring flaw that keeps on propagating through one report after another. They're up to number six already. However, Van Weingarten and Happer got it right. They got exceptionally good agreement with satellite observations, and that's what tells you when something is correct. First, we have to tell you what forcing is. Forcing refers to radiation that is carrying energy. And the unit is normally watts per square meter. So the sun forces radiation upon the earth. 340 watts per meter reach the earth from the sun, but about 100 watts of that is reflected right back into space. And that's why we say about 30%, 30% is reflected away. And that's why we say that the albedo, or indicated by alpha, is equal to 0 0.3. And I emphasize that you don't look for another decimal place there because these numbers have got a lot of, a lot of flakiness and space in them, and they change from hour to hour every day. But the general idea then, if this much has gone back into space, then 239 watts enters the Earth's atmosphere and makes a difference. And the energy transfer that comes about this way is important because the one thing you have to be sure of, if there's 239 watts per square meter coming in, there better be 239 watts per square meter going out, and it is. So here's what the picture looks like. You've seen this before, so I'm not going to spend much time on it. But you've got sunlight coming in, but lots of it reflected off with the upward yellow arrows. But it, about 51% of the sunlight does reach the ground or the ocean. And thereupon, certain things start happening, like evaporation and uh, uh, drifting upward of air, the, uh, uh, carrying the latent heat of vaporization up to the high clouds of five, 10,000 feet, uh, 10,000 meters even, where you uh, lose that energy back into the nitrogen or oxygen. And then from there, in the upper troposphere and the stratosphere, you start to see radiation capable of escaping to space. And the way the planet cools is by the escaping of space. And there's one little arrow there on the right that's worth mentioning. There's a window in the atmosphere where none of these gases affect uh, light. Therefore, the photons leaving the Earth in that narrow wavelength range get out for free with no obstruction, no interference, no delay. <clears throat> well, on a per molecule basis, all five of these gases look pretty much the same. And here's from a paper that Van Weingarten and Happer wrote in 19, 2019. They calculated the per molecule forcings in what is called an optically thin atmosphere. Now that's a fine term, and it implies that there is no um, interference or no absorption by any other gas. And that makes a lot of difference because in a real atmosphere, you do have interference, you have saturation, you have other effects, but in an optically thin case, you don't. And what you find out is that carbon dioxide, ozone, water, nitrous oxide, and methane all have very comparable forcings on a per molecule basis. And it is the confusion of full reality with per molecule that has led to the whole GWP fiasco. There would not be a discussion of global warming potential if people were not mesmerized by the idea of the per, per molecule absorption of things. There's also a phenomenon called saturation. What happens is your molecular energy uh, levels include, for a molecule that can rotate and vibrate and squiggle and fiddle around, like a polyatomic molecule, CO2, H2O, et cetera, you have vibration and rotational energies as well as energy levels. So the spectrum you get contains thousands of lines representing these transitions from one level to another. Well, the center of a band always absorbs and or emits uh, energy most intensely. And as the density of this stuff goes up, as you get more and more of it in the atmosphere, then the wings of the bands get involved too. The net result is that the progression of the active states grows logarithmically. And if the growth is logarithmic, 
the absorption curve is falling off exponentially. So here's what an absorption curve looks like. This one is for carbon dioxide, but it's important to realize that they all would have the same kind of shape. Way, way down near the zero parts per million, you get a significant and important effect. But when you go up to um, today's value, which we clear up here at like about 410, 420, it's all gone. And it has been all gone for quite some time. The first 20 parts per million take 80% of the action. That's how important absorption is. Methane, nitrous oxide, ozone, they're all way down here. They have a tiny, tiny amount, very close to zero. Well, no wonder they have a big effect, but that's what saturation is all about. And by the way, water would be so far off to the right that we don't have enough paper to reach it. You know, uh, water is thoroughly saturated, far beyond uh, any amount that you might even be talking about for these gases. So the greenhouse effect is as follows. The earth emits black body radiation, surface of the ocean, surface of land, it's a smooth curve of radiation, and it's determined by the surface temperature for the Earth. The average across the Earth is like 15 C, which is um, uh, 288 degrees Kelvin. Well, the atmosphere absorbs and emits some radiation as these photons go off. And some of them are sent back towards Earth, some in the direction outward and so forth. And what this does is it slows down the planet's cooling. Radiation to space doesn't make it quite so fast. Well, the result of this is that the surface stays warmer than if there were no atmosphere. But if you think about how the coolest part of the night is always just before dawn at 6 or 7 a.m., if the Earth was spinning slower and the night lasted longer, the Earth would get a whole lot cooler. But what happens is it's cooling, 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 and then the sun comes up and the whole cycle starts over again. Now, the net radiation that escapes from the Earth is in general less than the black body curve because you start off with black body and these gases take out pieces of it so you get less uh, going away. And what you have is a comparison of two curves where the area that is missing, the area between the two curves, that's the greenhouse effect. So here's an example of it. You have a black body curve for 300 Kelvin. This data was taken in the Western Pacific over Guam way back in the year 1970. The actual measured data over all these areas is less than the black body curve for certain reasons. At low frequencies, water is what's doing all the absorbing. And water continues to absorb quite a bit. But look at this. Carbon dioxide has a band that is at about 660 um, uh, inverse centimeters or 15 microns. And that really makes a difference. So there's water. Oh, and by the way, there's water also absorbing, absorbing, absorbing down here. The area, this zone here, this plus this and this, all together adds up to the greenhouse effect. And this is what we're talking about and have been talking about for three decades with IPCC reports, et cetera. Now, the calculation by Van Weingarten and Happer used the real atmosphere. They took all the gases that are in the atmosphere and considered them. So all five of the greenhouse gases were there all at once. That's a lot different from what the IPC does. The IPCC doesn't do it that way. He used real concentrations as in 300, 400 parts per million of CO2. And he did not do the per molecule case because they knew that H2O and CO2 had already reached degrees of saturation. So there was no sense looking at per molecule for those uh, gases. Well, turned out water is the dominant greenhouse gas. We've known that for a hundred years. Carbon dioxide is secondary, and by the way, it really counts. It's about 25% of the greenhouse effect. Ozone matters out in the stratosphere, okay? And that protects us from the ultraviolet light, too. Methane, nitrous oxide, 
completely vanish in importance. And as we go through these, you'll see that why that is. So here was their terrific achievement. Uh, stunning agreement with measurements. I think uh, in their text of their thing, they, they said something like exceptional or uh, uh, something like that, quantitative agreement. You've got a left-hand column, which is all their calculations and theory. The right-hand column is data. Compare each left to right, left to right, left to right. Look as hard as you can at those drawings and try to find a difference. That's how good their calculations were. You have the top things are for Sahara Desert type conditions, okay? Looking at the Sahara Desert from outer space. You would expect on a black body basis that there were, it would follow this little dashed red curve at the top. That's your black body curve for 320 Kelvin, which is the temperature of the Sahara Desert. So the greenhouse effect is all that area that is missing. Water throughout much of it, CO2 in particular here, ozone there, more of water. The agreement is exquisite. Now go someplace else. Out in the Mediterranean, it's cooler, no, no uh, uh, much more water in the atmosphere. And again, you have a certain black body curve in red, a calculated spectrum there, and the observations from the satellites. And the most significant one of all, in my opinion, is the one in Antarctica, because something different happened there. Here's what they calculated in Antarctica. But the red line is the black body curve. Well, you say, hey, how can you get above the black body curve? And the answer is the atmosphere above all that ice in Antarctica is warmer. So CO2 in particular, it was a dent here but down here, it is actually putting forth more radiation than the surface below. This, compare this with the data. Amazing. You never, never run an experiment to get data this good or, or get theory, theory this good that, that matches so well. Here's their major accomplishment. Making your theory match the data is the correct use of the scientific method. That's what you have to do if you're going to call it science. Now, because the agreement is so good between their calculations and the actual measurements, at last we've got a computational model that we can trust. IPCC models aren't like that. They don't get good agreement. So as a consequence, now we're free to start doing numerical experiments. And for example, we can consider double CO2, half as much CO2, no CO2 at all, or other gases. And that's exactly what they did. And the important point is, because we now have this theory that we can count on, we don't have to rely upon artificially constructed numbers, one of which is the global warming potential. Now, the first experiment they did was for carbon dioxide. Uh, you see this legend up here at the upper right, F equals zero, F equals one, F equals two. That means green is zero carbon dioxide. F equals one means today's carbon dioxide, which is about 400 parts per million. F equals two means we doubled it. So what do you got? <clears throat> Again, the faint blue curve is your black body. Here comes the calculated spectrum where water has been absorbing, 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 and all this sort of thing. And then suddenly, oh, if you have no carbon dioxide, it keeps right on going with just the water absorption up here. And then you come to the atmospheric window where nothing absorbs. You come to the notch for ozone. You come down here and water takes over again. But if you take the amount of CO2 that is realistic, that is 400 parts per million, you get the black curve. And that's what we know all the time from experiments and measurements. And now let's double CO2. That's the red curve. Well, look at it. Can you find the difference? These little teensy little blips here and here on there. That's the only difference that's made when you double CO2. Remember I said that the area, dif the difference in areas under the curve is what constitutes the greenhouse effect. Well, how much area have you added with this little thingy thing here and this little teeny here? Not very much. And therein is the message, the doubling 
CO2 doesn't make very much difference. Now, the Zoom, uh, then they did a very smart thing. They said, hey, we can do this for zero, for uh, regular, for two, twice. Let's do it for a whole bunch of different ones. So they did it for 50, then double that to 100, double that to 200, double that to 400, double that to 800. Didn't make any difference anyplace else. It was just in the big CO2 notch. So let's zoom in on that. When you've got zero CO2, you got the green curve, okay? As soon as you put in 50 parts per million, you get the light blue curve. Look at how deep that well is. That's a huge effect due to CO2 that happened in less than 50 parts per million. Double it again, you get the, the dark blue curve. Double it once more, you get the violet curve. Double it again, and you're up to 400, so you get the black curve. Double it again, you're 800, <clears throat> and that's the um, orange curve. Little tiny differences on the wings, the sides of the absorption band. And by the way, kind of eyeball these steps and notice they're all about the same size from each doubling gives you about the same uh, increase. So what do you know? This completely agrees with the absorption curve, the saturation curve. Early on, a big effect, then not so much, not less, 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 and awfully very little at all. Uh, the, becomes blue at the pre-industrial point, then up to the present day, well, when they did this thing, it was 380 or so, but here's our present day. And then out there in the direction uh, towards very high is in the direction of Dublin. But this matches exactly what you just saw with the consecutive steps of increasing CO2. The action is all in the first few um, uh, parts per million. The same would be true for either nitrous oxide or ozone or methane. They all will have curves uh, saturation curve shaped like this, but your ozone, methane, et cetera, doesn't have very much, so they haven't gone out their curve at all. Now, we also can do the same thing for methane, all right? So CO2 and H2O are normal, but methane is what we're gonna vary this time. And, and once again, you've got curves for zero, for one, that means normal today, and for double. Well, what do we see? Nothing at all over here, but there's some action here. So let's zoom in on it. And now you see the effect of changing methane. No methane at all is the green curve. Black is today's value. Red is doubled methane. Can anybody see the difference between the red and the black curve at all? Is there anything there? Is there any cr increase in the area that is the greenhouse effect? because of that change. No, it is virtually invisible. And this is the correct way to do calculations about methane, not the, not the GWP stuff that the IPC does. This is real physics that Van Weingarten and Happer have done. Well, let's see about nitrous oxide, okay? Once again, nothing going on for the big, big region, which is involving H2O and CO2, but we see a little action over here. So let's zoom in on this area. And what do we get? Green is for no nitrous oxide. Little bitty difference there. Black is today's uh, nitrous oxide, which is something like a third of a part per million. And then we consider doubling nitrous oxide and we get the red curve. You can't even tell the red apart from the black by the thickness of the line. That's how incredibly negligible nitrous oxide is. It's nothing there. It has no role in the greenhouse effect. Greenhouse effect is carbon dioxide and especially water, but not either nitrous oxide or methane. Okay, so what does it all mean? If carbon dioxide were zero, it would make a big difference. You'd be missing 25% of the greenhouse effect, and that would cause the Earth to be cooler. If CO2 is doubled, it makes a very small difference. We saw that as by those increments from 50, 100, 200, etc. Very small difference because it's saturated. Methane and nitrous oxide are incredibly hard to find any place. 
So their contribution to the greenhouse effect is trivial. They are irrelevant. Oh, and by the way, molecules of even tinier concentrations have even less effect. The freons, they're making a big deal out of it with a treaty, uh, the Montreal Protocol and freon in the ozone layer and all this stuff. Greenhouse, no effect whatsoever, even though their global warming potential numbers turn out to be ridiculously high. So here's the implications of it. One, when you get agreement between theory and experiment, you are doing good science. This is what you're supposed to do. Uh, Fred Singer used to say that data trumps theory, which means that if your theory and experiment don't agree, you better go fix your theory. A point that was made very strongly also by Richard Feynman throughout the 20th century. Well, the method of Van Weingarten and Happer actually meets this criteria. It is so far superior to the general circulation models that are featured in IPCC reports that always, always predict high temperatures for the climate sensitivity. So more CO2 makes only a tiny difference and more nitrous oxide or methane is tinier still, even far less than the effect of CO2. There's policy implications because of this. You have to acknowledge they got it right. The right thing to do is to accept the results of Ayn Weingarten and Happer instead of the words you'll find in the IPCC summary for policymakers. That's the document that everybody reads. Nobody reads the big reports. But the answer is there is no climate emergency. Greenhouse gases are not going to stop the climate from changing. It changes all the time. But if there's no climate emergency, then do not take expensive actions to mitigate climate change and do not strive to reduce carbon dioxide or the other greenhouse gases. So we're saying they're definitely on the wrong track with the IPCC approach. How do we get there? I mentioned there's a summary for policymakers written with each uh, report but it's written by diplomats and not by scientists. And boy, a lot is lost in the translation. There's busy people like uh, leading senators, politicians, parliamentarians, prime ministers and all that. They only read, not even the summary, but the highlights from the summary. So they're missing an awful lot. The real science gets buried very deeply inside. And I should mention that all kinds of papers are being written and trying to get published by people who use the data of the IPCC itself to show what's wrong with the IPCC reports. They're not renegades. They don't have a theory out of left field. They're using IPCC information to look more carefully at it. So your science is deep inside. The IPCC reports, which are big fat things, about 1,000 pages. Working group one looks at the science. And that's what we're doing. We, we're, the field that we're in is contesting with working group one. Working group two believes what working group one said and then asks what's going to happen. And then working group three believes what working group two said and asks what ought to be done about it. Notice that if working group one were to say, hey, there's no climate emergency, then working group two and three would have nothing to do. <laughs> They're on the bench, they, they don't have a function. Well, why hasn't this happened? Because of things like prestige, money, all the momentum keep going to push this further and further. Uh, the Kyoto Protocol 20 some years ago, the um, Paris Accord, a lot of momentum behind these things. But this all missing the point that these gases don't affect things, and there is no climate emergency. The IPC made several fundamental errors. The foremost, in my opinion, is they considered dry air. They didn't use real air. Remember, the standard atmosphere doesn't exist in the real world. You make it in the laboratory by desiccants and other ways. However, it's really easy to do the numerical calculations with a dry air because without water getting in the way, you can do calculations much more easily. 
However, real air always contains some water, even if you're over the desert. There's enough water in any real air so the saturation always occurs for both H2O and CO2. It has been widely agreed, really, honestly, going back even earlier than Arrhenius to John Tyndall's time, water is the major greenhouse gas. Nobody doubts that. But if you're gonna do a calculation, that's the first gas you ought to do, not put one in later. Nobody ever does a perturbation calculation by waiting till later to put in the main component. That's crazy. The other thing they did wrong at the IPC was they didn't use the proper feedback mechanism. They assumed the feedback was gonna be positive. Temperature goes up, more water evaporates in the ocean, much more gas closer to the ground, which makes the rise in temperature, which makes water, water evaporate, da, 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 et cetera. Um, Manabi last December gave the Nobel Prize lecture, and you can easily find that on the internet and look at, he only talked for about 20 minutes, but that would give you a synopsis of that entire process. However, nature isn't like the IPCC. Nature contains negative feedback. Any system is governed by what's called Le Chatelier's principle, which says that the system tends to revert to the equilibrium position. When you, when you push it one way, you perturb it, it tends to come back. That's negative feedback. That's what nature does. The other thing they did was they even misunderstood the application, uh, amplification mechanism for feedback, as uh, pointed out by Moncton and collaborators in a big paper, the feedback acts on the entire signal, not just on the perturbation. And to leave that out is a mistake in the way you use feedback. So here comes part two. I'm gonna tell you why global warming potential is a useless number. If you dig deep enough into the fourth uh, IPCC report called AR4, pages 210 to 214, you'll find the method described for calculating global warming potential. What they were trying to do is get a ratio of how much difference this gas made compared to CO2, so that the index is CO2 equals one and all the other gases are a different number. Well, when you read through the text, there's this equation that's a triple integral and it's an ungodly thing. It's got all these functions in it and everything. Readers going through that are intimidated. They just skim over it and, and keep right on going and they just skip back a couple of pages and look at the table of values. Well, in the text itself, if they had read a little further, they'd find there were simplifying assumptions introduced and without data, they sent certain things equal to one and uh, Will Happer, a, a refined, uh, eminent scientist, very uh, honorable, uh, well-speaking gentleman, used the term, it was fuzzed up with poorly known forcing times and indirect effects. Um, you're free to translate that differently across the Atlantic. Well, there's a lengthy table of GWP's values that are presented in this section of AR4 that include Methane, N2O, but a whole lot more, including the free ions. But they missed the whole point. Methane is irrelevant, and the GWP calculation is irrelevant for three important reasons. First, there isn't very much methane. It's less than two parts per million. CO2, remember, is up at 400, and H2O at a percent and a half of the atmosphere would be 15,000 parts per million. H2O outcompetes methane for the same spectral region. They overlap, they absorb in the same area. If you're down in the troposphere, you get what's called collision broadening, and that makes the H2O lines fatten up so that they are almost a continuum. It really looks like a continuum. And the photons that might have been captured by methane are instead captured by water because there's so much more water. It's only when you're up in the stratosphere do we, what we say the comb of lines, the individual lines from H2O and CH4 miss each other. But when you're up in the stratosphere, you've got two parts per million or less of methane and about four parts per million of H2O. So even there, H2O has a slight advantage, but we're mostly looking at what's going on down low, not up in the stratosphere. 
The other thing that is easily overlooked is that there is very little energy emitted by the Earth in the range where CH4 is able to absorb. Remember that black body spectrum for 288 Kelvin, it peaks out at 15 microns, which is right where CO2 is. But on the other hand, when you're down at seven and a half microns, that's like about 1300 uh, wave numbers, less than 20% of the peak. So the, if the earth is a dimmer light bulb, methane, the absorber is going to be able to participate less. So, and also the absorption band for CH4 is very narrow, whether, whereas the absorption band for water is extremely wide. Well, the IPCC didn't take any of these into account when they were calculating the idea of global warming potential. Okay. What's really going on is that the global warming potential number, more, the most important factor therein is the ratio of two slopes. It's the slope of the saturation curve for methane divided by the slope of saturation for CO2. And when we look at the picture, you'll see the vertical axis is absorption, the horizontal axis is the concentration, how many parts per million. Well, when they raised this data, uh, this, this graph, CO2 was 385 parts per million, but that's almost the same as we have today. And the CO2 absorption is very nearly saturated. The curve is practically flat. What's the slope of a flat curve, practically? A very tiny negative number. Whereas concentration of CH4 at 1.8 uh, parts per million is a very steeply declining curve of, of saturation way back near the zero parts. So what's its slope? A steep number, a big number, a large number. There it is. Every one of these gases would have a curve just like this one. The methane is up here, CO2 is out here. N2O is up here, ozone is up here. And by the way, the freons are so close to the zero axis that you can't even find them. So all that stuff that's taking place is comparing this slope here with the slope out here. That is a really fundamental characteristic of the global warming potential uh, calculation. Well, what do you get? In a division problem, quotient is equal to numerator over the denominator. Denominator, well, you can't divide by zero. But when the denominator is close to zero, what are you going to get? You're going to get a huge quotient, a very large number. Make an increase of one part per million. CO2 saturation curve goes from 410 to 411 parts per million. It's nearly flat. The slope hardly changes at all. Methane, take it from 1.8 to 2.8, you know, one part per million, and you get this large slope. So now this slope gets a little bit less, but it's still very large. So you've got a great big numerator and a little tiny denominator. And what do you get? Magical numbers for methane, 28. Nitrous oxide, about 300. And the freons are all greater than 1,000. These are ridiculous. Not one of them has any meaning at all. They're all an artifact of this, this uh, um, erroneous form of, of approach to calculation. The real spectrum, the real greenhouse effect is what you saw in the calculations of Van Weingarten and Happen. That's real. These numbers are imaginary and the method of calculation is very poor. And they should never have been used. Well, here I have what I call famous last words. In the third assessment report, which came out about the year 2001, they said, the climate system is a coupled, nonlinear, chaotic system. And therefore, the long-term prediction of future exact climate states is not possible. This ought to be carved on the front of the capital of every parliament building in the world, okay? The elected officials absolutely need to get this message clearly and understand it. Predicting the long-term future is not possible. And that is, uh, I think, maybe the core message that all of us are trying to tell our elected officials and political leaders. 
So <laughs> policy implications once again. We accept the method of Van Weingarten and Happer because it works. It agrees with experiment and measurement. And you don't go for the IPCC summary for policymakers or you do not use those faulty contrived global warming potential numbers. We've seen that the trace gases do not influence the greenhouse effect. None of them, those little teensy wiggles you can barely find, add any area to that space between the black body curve and the actual curve. There is no climate emergency. And by the way, greenhouse gases are not going to be able to keep the climate from changing. You can't mitigate your way out of climate change. It's going to keep on changing forever. So do not take expensive actions to mitigate climate change. Do not strive to reduce carbon dioxide or other greenhouse gases. And by all means, do not impose new regulations and laws upon farmers. Totally counterproductive.